Good evening. I'm Nan Geschke, host of the Los Altos History Show. This, is, this evening's guest is Dick Henning. Welcome to the History Show, Dick. We're so happy to have you here tonight. Thank you for having me, Nan. Oh, it's just our pleasure. Dick Henning is very active in the community of Los Altos. He has served as president of several organizations, including the Rotary Club, United Way, and Phi Delta Kappa. He's served on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce of Los Altos, was a founding member of the Los Altos Sister Cities Organization and is a founding member of the Los Altos Community Foundation. Dick is also very well known on the Foothill College campus, having served here as Dean of Community Services, Development and Public Relations for over 30 years. And before that time, he served as Director of Student Activities, where he conceptualized the widely acclaimed Celebrity Forum. Dick, uh, we're here tonight to really talk about that celebrity forum. And how did you ever come up with such a brilliant idea? Well, I'm not so sure it was brilliant. <laughs> um, as you know, out of adversity, sometimes great ideas do come. This was the late uh, 60s, and there was a lot of turmoil, turbulence uh, on the campuses throughout the country. And we had our little group of students who wanted to boycott the sale of student body cards. Now, that's the only income that we have for the associated students. Oh, wow. And so I got together with uh, the student leaders and said, instead of forcing them to buy the student body card, which is we could have done, let's make the card valuable. And we created uh, for the succeeding year uh, four programs that would be free of charge to the students. And one was uh, musicals and drama. Another was a, uh, exhibits from throughout the United States were, that would travel around and we would have them in the library mm -hmm. and we would pay for that through the student fees. Another was the uh, speaker series and then in those days uh, the rock concerts. Oh, okay. But, so I, uh, I guess, guess which one was most popular with the students, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, guess which one was most popular. Uh, the, the speaker series uh, was held in the gymnasium and we held it on Friday nights. Uh, some students did attend but uh, they evidently had some better things to do on Friday nights. And we had offered it to the community for $2. It was free to students, but $2 if a community member wanted to come up. What a bargain, well, even it, in those days. It huh? was a bargain, mm -hmm. and they did want to come. And the gymnasium is huge, and we would get 2,000, 2,500 people from the community to come. And the speakers in those days, unlike today, were $600, uh, all of them. $600, they paid for their own transportation, their own hotel, and we were making money because we were collecting $4,000 to $6,000. So we knew from the beginning we had a pretty good had deal. Had a winner. Had a winner. Right. right. So who were some of those early entertainers? The first four speakers we had, and this was January of 1968 through June of 68, we had Ogden Nash, we had Louis Leakey, the famous anthropologist, yeah. Uh, we had um, Edwin O. Reischauer. He had just returned as being the ambassador to Japan uh, from Harvard, a uh, well-known family. And we ended in June with Alistair Cook. And I can even remember the day, and there's a reason why. It was June 4th. The next day, Alistair Cook was going down to Los Angeles to be with Bobby Kennedy on oh. June 5th, the day he was assassinated. So he was actually with he him? He was there with him. Oh, yeah. interesting. Uh, some of the entertainers, uh, we had some of the big ones, uh, some of them still around. Uh, we had uh, the Grateful Dead, we had uh, Taj Mahal, uh, the, um, well, we had singers such as Judy Collins, Joan Baez, uh -huh. uh, we had uh, Tower of Power, 
uh, Jefferson Airplane with uh, Grace Slick. Now that brings us back a few years. It does. <laughs> Those were the years. Uh, and uh, there was a little consternation about it. Uh, some of the people who came were not our students, and there was a little trouble caused, and it eventually uh, was um, uh, phased out. But mm -hmm. the speaker series continued. So are there any other speakers that the, in the, those really well, early years? Yeah, way back. Now, some of these names you may not um, remember, but there were people, of course you do remember, Pearl S. Buck, yes. Indira Gandhi. Ah. Uh, we had um, Margaret Mead, uh, Ogden Nash, I think I mentioned him. We had Dick Gregory, Mary Leakey, the wife of Louis Leakey, yes. came. She hated to give a public speech, but she finally did did come after I begged her. Uh, S.I. Hayakawa, you may remember him from San Francisco State. Oh, he was uh, with his Tam O'Shanter? Did, did he wear his oh, Tam O'Shanter? Yeah. He had that with him at all times. I, I had him two or three times, actually, over the years. Uh, Bill Cosby, way back when he was just starting. Nobody knew who Bill Cosby was, uh, but he was great even then. Uh, Ralph Nader, Jacques Cousteau, uh, we had Dean Rusk, Alex Haley, and um, Ben Bradley during the Whitewater affairs. So we had, they were, they were pretty well known back then. And um, some Whitewater of the, or? Uh, uh, water, uh, water, Watergate. Watergate, okay. Um, yeah, Whitewater's on my mind <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> Watergate. <laughs> Go back a couple of decades for right. that one. So um, I know, I think we're going to bring up our first photo. Uh, Dick was um, so kind to lend us uh, a lot of his photos from, uh, from over the years. And uh, we thought we'd, we'd start with some of the guests and um, people who, who uh, came to speak with, um, in the series uh, during the 70s and start, starting with uh, this gentleman. Um, um, Mark Russell. Mark Russell. And I know he, he's, he's one of your favorites. Uh, he's a wonderful man, a real professional. He's definitely here to stay. He writes all of his own stuff, and he will come into a town, and uh, he will never do uh, one event after another. He always has one day before free and one day after free, and he's writing new material. He writes the first 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, he watches C-SPAN, reads the newspaper. He says it's the easiest job in the world now. <laughs> Uh, with uh, all that's going on. But uh, I started with him in the 1970s when he was really unknown, and I've had him every November during the main election, the general election, uh, every four years for the last 24 years. Oh. And one time in the early 70s, I arranged for him to appear at IBM, and IBM was celebrating an end of a two-year project that the uh, scientists were involved in. These were all men. And it was really kind of a thank you to the wives who had been neglected during this time. And the IBM was a little uptight about the phrase, uh, woman's lib. So they said, don't use that phrase. Uh -huh. And he said, OK. He walked out on the stage, and he said, good evening. Welcome to that ought to hold the little lady for another year banquet. <laughs> uh, actually, the IBMers loved it. Um, he, uh, <laughs> Uh, he is very, very fair. He criticizes both the Republicans and the Democrats even. Oh, like, well, we were at uh, Dick's 30th anniversary uh, a year ago. Oh, that's right, um, October. In October, and Mark Russell was the entertainment, and uh, he was just priceless. He'd go outside, aching. He was, he was wonderful. So uh, the next photo up on our monitor right now is... Carl, Carl Sagan. Sagan. Yes, Carl Sagan uh, was very, very popular in the 70s. He had a television program. And uh, when, now I am not uh, that knowledgeable about astronomy. He had 10 slides, and I personally could not tell the difference between the first slide and the 10th slide. This is a slide of the stars out there in the universe, and he's pointing things out. But the people loved it. The, the people in this area, um, a lot of them know a great deal about astronomy, and he was a big hero to them. So it was a great program. Even then, I mean, he, Even then, he back, went on to his days. wonderful uh, TV series yes, that he did right. on uh, PBS. Yeah. So, uh, and this woman, maybe some people would not recognize, right. but she is Elizabeth Kubler Ross. Ross. And in the 70s, uh, Death and Dying was very popular, <laughs> or at least <laughs> her book was. Uh, it was called Death kind and Dying. Kind of the first time that people approached it this, was. Uh, this it, subject. Exactly. And there are five stages of death that she wrote about. And 
she worked a great deal with children who were dying. Mm -hmm. uh, she worked with everyone. In fact, we had her at our home, stayed overnight in our home, and she spent most of the time that night and early in the morning on the telephone talking to people who had uh, friends and relatives who were dying. Oh, fascinating. A so stunning she, presentation. She was really just really actively involved with, with a lot of people. Who yes, were, you know. yes. She, uh, she, she was like a Mother Teresa for those who were dying in hospices. I uh, remember seeing her. I, I don't think I saw her in person, but I re remember seeing her on television at the time. And incredible person. Very yes. popular. So this gentleman, now he's, uh, he must have been really interesting. Dick. Truman Capote. Howdy. Well, there was a little problem. When uh, I had assigned him, he was ready to come, and about two weeks before he appeared for me, he had walked off a stage at a university in the middle of his talk he had consumed too much uh, alcohol and drugs. And so, when he arrived, I met him at the airport. I stayed with him every moment to watch him, make sure that he only drank Perrier. We went <laughs> up to San Francisco. We saw Herb Cain. We went up to Sausalito, met with some writers all the time. Every time he asked for a drink, I made sure there was a Perrier there, Perrier. <laughs> and I can guarantee you, he had nothing but Perrier until he walked on that stage. And after I introduced him and he walked right by me, I could almost hear that Perrier sloshing as he was walking <laughs> up there. Now, he gave, uh, he actually read uh, his material from his book. Some people criticized him for that. Uh, at least they said the program wasn't as good as they thought it was going to be. But for me, I thought it was a very, very um, wonderful evening to have an author read his, his own, own material words. and emphasize where he wanted the emphasis. And it was totally different than the way you and I might have read it. Yeah. So I oh. thought it was a very successful evening. Oh. Well, that would I would have loved to have been to that. And he was sober. It was very successful. Yeah. <laughs> well, this gentleman coming up on the monitor right now is someone who really spells 1970s, doesn't he? Yes, John Dean the Third, And I really hesitated to have him in the series because he had to serve some time in jail. But I was convinced that he was one of the most honest people involved in the, the, uh, all of the, the problems with uh -huh. Nixon and uh, Watergate, and he gave a, a good speech. He is not the most electrifying speaker, but uh, people really enjoyed the fact that he brought his wife, Mo, and she was there with him. And, she was uh, kind of a celebrity she, at that time. She was time. kind of a celebrity, yes. Yeah. Very nice looking lady, and was always seen in the, in the row behind him when uh, the investigation was being carried on television. I know, I could remember watching the, the hearings and, uh, and seeing her and thinking she was quite attractive. Right. Yes. And I can remember so vividly when uh, Nixon uh, had to resign in August. I was up in Portland, Oregon. We'd just done some salmon fishing. We were outside. We took the TV out there, and then he had to announce that uh, he was resigning as President of the United States. And uh, those, uh, those were interesting times back uh, in the 70s. I know. We almost had uh, a repeat. A repeat this of that. Uh, That's right. This Watergate, Whitewater, uh, and uh, Monica Lewinsky, Lewinsky, the whole now, package. This this person is uh, Dr. Is Joyce, Joyce Brothers. Brothers. You know, an interesting thing occurred that night. Joyce Brothers went out and had no notes, and she had her speech memorized. And afterwards, the people criticized her for reading it. She didn't read a word. She memorized it. And I don't know if you know this story, uh, but she had tremendous capacity to memorize things. In fact, she and her husband sat at the breakfast table one day and decided, how am I going to become more well-known? And she decided that she would go on the $64,000 question. Oh, I remember that. That's how yeah. she really just sort of Which came her into her own. Was so good. And so her husband said, well, it has to be something finite. So I've got it. It has to be something unusual. It'll be boxing. She memorized everything there was to know about boxing, went on that show, and won the $64,000. $1,000. And then from there on in, she's had a career. From there on in, yeah. So yeah. Her, uh, her ability to memorize things really was a great help to her. Interesting. I wish I had her memory. Oh, me too. <laughs> yeah. Now this person, some of us may not be able to recognize. Who is the this? old picture. That's Buckminster Fuller. And I had him on the stage when he was in his 80s. Uh, one of the, the greatest thinkers of all times. Uh, at that time, he... Uh, took a hold of the microphone, and they had a long cord, and he would roam up and all along the, the stage, but also some of his thoughts were kind of roaming also, <laughs> and uh, lost a few of the people in the audience. But I was really happy I had him, because he was such um, a well-known 
uh, early thinker about the future. Very few futurists uh, yes. in that day, and he was one who was, uh, he was right on the money with uh, most of his ideas, and he was a very gentle man. Um, I wish I'd had him 10 years earlier, but uh, he, he gave a great program. Uh, particularly afterwards, we listened to the tape, and we, we could hear some outstanding things, and we typed those up, and we distributed them to the people in the audience so that they wouldn't have lost it, because sometimes he was rambling a little bit too much. Oh, interesting. Now, this person is, well, I remember him from the 70s, and he's still around. But David uh, Frost, yes, you still do see him yes. occasionally interviewing. I think he has a program from uh, London. From London. Well, I had a most embarrassing experience with him. He was uh, very busy. He had just interviewed Nixon on television. Everybody knew who David Frost was. And he was flying into San Francisco just one hour before he was to appear down in Cupertino. Now, everything went right would be no problem. And indeed, when I arrived there, of course, I'm nervous about this. I parked my car, I ran up, and I caught him right there as he's getting off the airplane. And it arrived on time at 7 o'clock. So we rushed down into the garage, and I could not find my car. Now, we've all misplaced our car from time to time, but we walked five different floors of this parking garage. <laughs> Here's this famous person following me around. Sometimes people would stop us, and they'd try to get an autograph. We walked around their garage for 45 minutes, finally found it. And, so frustrated. <laughs> oh, I, I tell you, that was one of the most, I guess, mistakes that I've ever made. The, the audience, though, did not move. They were 45 minutes late. I walked on the stage and I said, here's David Frost. He came out to the microphone and he started talking about how I lost my car in the garage. <laughs> and he said, I don't care. I didn't care whether I was going to walk around the garage or come out and speak to you nice people. I was going to get my $10,000 anyway. Oh, he came right out and said it, huh? Yes. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, this lady. Pearl Bailey. Bailey. Oh, what a sweetheart she uh, was. She, it, you know, um, she was an international um, goodwill person. She, she did more for America, just like Louis Armstrong, went around the, the world and made friends for America. And in her contract, she had to speak only. She couldn't sing. But at the end of the program, she said, oh, the heck with the contract. And she builded out a couple of uh, songs a cappella, just beautifully done. And incidentally, when she was on our stage, she had just completed a BA degree at college. She went back I as a that about her. as a 50-year-old and completed her degree, Good which is her. very commendable. Good. So that kind of concludes our uh, 80s. But uh, this next gentleman, I think, is I think the toastmaster of, of of television, and I think he still is considered that. Um, and Mr. Walter Cronkite. Yeah, Uncle Walter. Yeah. Everybody uh, trusted him. Uh, unlike today. He was, uh, he was the person you would go to to listen to, and you really believed. If he said it, then it was real, it was true. And when he was on our stage, he, uh, it was the first speech he gave after he retired. And it was really a coup for us to get him yes. uh, as the first speaker, uh, the first speech. And the problem, however, was that he said he didn't want to speak more than uh, 15 minutes. And I always try to have the speaker speak for about 50 minutes, almost an hour and then take questions for a half hour. Well, after he spoke for 15 minutes, the very first question, don't remember what it was, but it took him 25 minutes to answer that question. <laughs> so I could have just simply given him two questions, and he would have done his uh, hour's talk. But uh, the people loved him, gave him a standing ovation. Oh, I think he looks like such a nice man, too. And this, and this woman has been part of our lives for a long time. And mm. Landers. You know, Ann Landers uh, does turn to experts for advice when she doesn't feel that she's capable of giving the answer. But I can tell you, of all the people we've had, and we've had some very, very intelligent people on our stage, she is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. She could talk about anything. She had answers to... Uh, we're not just talking about uh, relationships, the kinds yes. of things that usually are in her column. She's very, very well read, very intelligent, and uh, a, a wonderful communicator. It was, a, it was a very interesting evening with her that night. Oh, great. Now this gentleman, beloved. Red Skelton, a uh, very, very talented man. Uh, I don't know that everyone realizes he was a great, a wonderful painter. Uh, he composed symphonies, uh, hundreds of them. Uh, he would write poetry. He wrote books. Uh, 
prose, literature of various types. Uh, and he would stay up every morning till 3 in the morning. He would come into a location where he's going to speak three days early. He'd walk around town. He was on our campus. He walked around the campuses, went, campus, went into classrooms, went into our drama class, talked to people. He created, uh, he uh, actually composed a song in one of the music classes. Uh, he never stopped thinking. He was a, a genius. And he was a genius at creating his characters that were so humorous. Oh, uh, I know. Uh, and and um, he had a following all of his life, from, from the early days when he was on radio uh, until he did shows, actually, in, uh, in Las Vegas. And the crowds would just come in just to see this man operate on stage. And he was so spontaneous that the audience sometimes would yell out a name to him that he had created, and then he would do it instantly. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, this is a, if we can go through some of these a little bit more quickly, uh, this is uh, Cary Cary Grant. Grant. I, you know, I could talk about him for hours. Uh, I got a telephone call from him, and it was a strange call in that uh, he was calling to answer a letter that I'd written three years earlier to tell me, no, he wouldn't be interested in speaking. Uh, he said he'd be too nervous, that he'd be awake at night. And I said, well, I'm sure we can work out something, a Q&A, or do something, because this would really be a feather in our cap if we could get Cary Grant, Grant on our stage. He was so careful about not appearing in public. Uh, and of course, eventually we did. Uh, it's a long story, but uh, I can tell you, he walked on that stage. He was 78 years old, poised. He had this steel stool in his hand. He came up, put it right in the middle of the stage, and said, after a film clip, now, are there any questions? And that went on for two hours. Oh, wonderful. Very intelligent man. Uh, oh. He was a wonderful person. Of course, Bob Hope. Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. He is such an easygoing man. People are trying to get his picture here, picture there, and he would just kind of do a little song. Oh, they want me to do the picture over here. I'll go over here. They want me to do this. Uh, right before we were going on stage, I said, is there anything in particular you want me to say about you in the introduction? He says, no, you say anything you want. I'll make a comeback. And afterwards, uh, after his program was over and he did this, I understand, every single night, he would go to his hotel, walk around the blocks, and he would stop, find an ice cream parlor and have an ice cream cone. And that was his habit at the end of each uh, e evening. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think, uh, I know that we have uh, several more people in the 80s, and I, I know that uh, you've, you've uh, interviewed or had Lucille Ball and Jerry Ford, Henry Kissinger, and uh, Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. as, uh, as one of your guests. Um, yes. uh, it must have been a thrill to have Jimmy Carter. It was, and it was one of the biggest surprises. When he stepped on that stage, he gave his short speech then he took questions for about an hour. And there was not a question that he couldn't answer precisely. And people oftentimes will ask me, was that really Jimmy Carter on that stage <laughs> that night? Yeah, well, he's yeah. such a wonderful, I, the best um, former president we've Absolutely. ever had. No yeah. question about that. Yeah, he's, yes. he's, he certainly has shown. Now, I know that some of um, the uh, uh, people that you've had in the 90s included uh, Margaret Thatcher and Irma Baumbach um, and uh, uh, Tom Wolfe. Um, but I'd love to, uh, to have you talk a little bit about uh, Gorbachev, because that must have been a wonderful uh, experience. It was. Uh, Gorbachev's talk was at our 25th silver anniversary. And he, this was the first public speech for uh, payment or fee that he gave. And in fact, we, uh, we sent 50% of his uh, honorarium to him in advance. And then backstage, uh, I gave him the other 50% by check. And it was a lot of money. And then I told him that I was going to go out on the stage. I would introduce him. Then I would come off the stage, and I'd come back for the mm -hmm. questions. And he said, uh, aren't you afraid to leave me, the former leader of the Communist Party, out there with your <laughs> audience alone? And I said, after no. I saw how fast you stuffed that check in your pocket, <laughs> I'm not worried about you any longer being a communist. Oh. Uh, he's a big capitalist Closet now. Cap capitalist. Yes, he is, and making some big money, yeah, including his pizza ad. I understand <laughs> that. Uh, and I know that uh, Bill, Bill Moyers is, um, is someone that uh, you um, admire, and all of us yes. admire, really. I've had him three times. Bill Moyers is uh, perhaps one of the best speakers, one of the best people I 
have ever had in the program. Uh, you know that he was in politics. He was uh, in charge of uh, several programs, including the Peace Corps. But, you know, I think that he learned enough about politics during that experience there that uh, he knew that he did not want to be in politics. Is that right? And I admire him for that. He wanted to do good, and I think that's why he created the PBS programs that he has. And uh, there's not a better person to be doing those kind of programs because he's so intensely, genuinely interested in people and helping people. Mm -hmm. And he comes yeah. across that way, you know, as being such a yeah. genuine. And I know that you've made um, a lot of friends uh, with, you know, some of some of the the people that we've, you know, talked about tonight. Um, who are some of your special friends? Well, of course, Bill Moyers is, is yeah. one of them. I do uh, continue to communicate with uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, oh, you do? I've had him three times, and he's invited me to f uh, to come fishing on uh, his. Uh, Property where he has a, a trout stream, and I'm uh, trying. I'm going to going to arrange that one of these days. Uh, I really miss Cary Grant. I had an opportunity to uh, uh, follow him around to do some engagements, uh, and got to know him very well. And his wife, his wife was 43 years younger. That was quite um, a difference in uh, age, but uh, not not in spirit. Wonderful couple. Uh, I tell you, there's so many. Richard Leakey. Uh, uh -huh. uh, now, I had the Leakey family. Really, I had Louis Leakey, Mary Leakey, Richard the son, and I've had him three times over the years. And I've visited him a couple of times in Kenya when I've taken safaris there. Uh, there are so many. The, and the speakers are such good people. You know, you, you get your hopes up. You're hoping yes. they're as good as what you anticipate, and they always have been. Um, and I know you've said, Dick, that, uh, you know, I said, well, it must you must have a lot of experience now with very difficult personalities, and you said no. absolutely not. They, they, they have they, been wonderful to work with. And easy. You put a glass of water up there, as long as the rostrum and the microphone's there, and that's all you have to worry about. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's been so delightful to have you uh, visit with us tonight, uh, Dick. It's been fun. I wish we had all evening to kind of, you know, recapture all of these Last At least 30. a couple hundred speakers I haven't mentioned. Oh, last, I know, absolutely. I, I think you have the list right there. Ralph Nader and, yeah, you know, go uh, on, and on. on and on. You know, it would be really interesting to just have you back sometime. Well, and, thank you, Nan. And uh, go this through This has been fun and it's been fast. I know. <laughs> it, it, the time always goes by, doesn't it? And it's been fun for us to share with you, our, our viewers, uh, Dick's experiences. and. Uh, and maybe it's brought some memories back for you, too. So thanks for watching the Los, Al Los Altos History Show, and we'll see you the next time.